Thanks for tuning into my channel, The Most Intriguing Military Battles. Today, we are continuing our special series on Napoleon's last campaign, the Battle of La Belle Alliance, also known as the Battle of Mont Saint-Jean, or the Battle of Waterloo. Well, to be more precise, today we are talking about the first part of that crucial day, June 18th of 1815, while our last episode will deal with the events that occurred in the afternoon of that day, the grand finale of the Battle of Waterloo. So, without further ado, let's jump right in. At the end of our second episode, we left our good friend Arthur and his troops as they exited Quatre Bras, relatively unscathed by the French, who were peacefully sleeping nearby. Neither Napoleon, who was just a couple hours away from Quatre Bras, nor Marshal Ney did anything to stop the Allied troops. And since the Prussians were still in recovery mode after their defeat at Ligny, Wellington was in no position to engage in a battle. Thus, he had to retreat and find a way to join Blucher, since neither of them would engage the combined Army du Nord without the other. And in the early hours of June 17th, neither Wellington nor Napoleon knew about the actual condition of the Prussian army, or the direction of its retreat. Both understood that Blucher would face internal pressure to retreat east towards Prussia to save his army. This would leave Wellington all alone to face Napoleon, something he simply would not do. Thus, good old Arthur had two major problems to resolve, where to retreat so the Prussians could link up with him, and how to do it, with the French troops of Marshal Ney right in front of him, and the even bigger army of Napoleon just a few hours away. He knew that an army in retreat would be a sitting duck. Since it is logistically impossible to simply pack up and leave, a gradual withdrawal was the only option but it would leave the remaining forces vulnerable to French attack. While there's no single point in the story where I can say, here is where Napoleon lost the battle, because there are actually several of these critical moments. I can say one thing for sure. The retreat from Quatre Bras was the opportunity to destroy Wellington and send Blucher back to Prussia to enjoy his retirement. And Napoleon and Ney squandered it in style. At 3 a.m. that morning, Wellington finally learned that they did not call Blucher Marshal Forward for nothing. The old general did not abandon his partner in crime after all, and didn't retreat east towards the safety of his homeland, but instead moved north towards Favre, while trying to find a way to link up with Wellington. This link would be made very challenging by the 33,000 strong French army under Marshal Grouchy who was sent to harass the retreating Prussians and ideally beat them, or at the very least, keep them from joining forces with Wellington. Thus, Wellington solved one problem in regards to the direction of his retreat. He wouldn't go home, not just yet, and instead would try to offer a battle on the grounds of his choosing, where the Prussians could potentially join him. Now that that was settled, there was another problem how to escape from Quatre Bras without being attacked. Luckily, Providence and the weather were on Wellington's side. After the French completely messed up by allowing the British Dutch troops to escape, weather made it impossible for Napoleon's troops to successfully pursue their retreating enemies. As Napoleon finally realized his mistake and sent his army to go after Wellington, the skies literally opened offering all involved a massively refreshing shower, which lasted the entire afternoon and the following night. Which brings us back to the issue of roads. As the Anglo-Dutch boys struggled through the muddy mess that used to be a road, their horses, carts, and feet made the road all but impassable for the pursuing Frenchmen. This allowed Wellington to get to his destination the side that he had chosen in advance, next to the village of Waterloo. And that is where Wellington's genius as a defensive general really showed. He chose the ground perfectly to compensate for the weakness of his army, while negating the strengths of his enemies. The field was about 2.5 miles long, bordered by a ridge running from east to west. Behind that ridge, Wellington concealed his strength from the French with the exception of his skirmishers and artillery. See, here's that reverse slope idea once again. 
in front of the ridge, there were three fortified structures that would play a critical role throughout the battle. Remember the lesson about the stone walled farms that Wellington learned during the Battle of Quatre Bras. On the extreme right were the chateau, garden, and orchard of Hougoumont. This was a large and well-built country house, hidden in the woods. On the extreme left was the hamlet of Papalette Farm. The left flank was also protected by dense woods. On the western side of the main road, and in front of the rest of Wellington's line, was the farmhouse and orchard of La Haye Saint, which was garrisoned with 400 light infantry of the King's German Legion. Any attack on his right center would mean the attackers would have to march in a crossfire, coming from Hougoumont and La Haye Saint. That left a head-on attack as the best available option. And Napoleon fully intended to do just that. His biggest challenge was to weaken Wellington's center, so his infantry could charge head-on. In order to accomplish this task, Napoleon would use two magic bullets, his artillery and deception. He reckoned that his guns would soften up the Anglo-Dutch center, preparing for the main assault, just like they did at Ligny. At the same time, Napoleon planned a diversionary assault on Wellington's right flank to convince him to move more troops away from the center, thus weakening it further. But that meant a direct attack on Hougoumont. To be clear, Napoleon never intended to capture that fortified structure. He just wanted to draw reinforcements away from the British center. This was a strategically beautiful plan, and Wellington would have had a hard time counterbalancing it. But fate intervened on the Allied side. Wellington knew that while the armies were reasonably well matched in terms of infantry numbers, 50,000 on each side, the French were much better trained and experienced. The British infantry had a slight advantage. Their brown bessies, British muzzle-loading smoothbore flintlock muskets. While in no way superior to the Charleville M1777 muskets used by French troops, British bessies were generally of a larger caliber, 0.75 inches or 19 millimeters, instead of 0.69 inches or 17.5 millimeter caliber French rifles. Thus, in the heat of the battle, British troops could use French ammunition, but not the other way around. In addition, French powder was much lower quality than the British version, causing the guns to malfunction, which was solved by hot water, or in an absence of such, urine. Wellington was also underpowered in the heavy cavalry department. The biggest advantage Napoleon had, however, were his daughters, a loving name for his artillery. Remember, Napoleon was an artillery man by training, and at heart. Napoleon had close to 250 guns, while Wellington scarcely had 150, and the French ones were generally better quality. Hiding behind the reverse slope would help Wellington's troops, since most of them were not in a direct line of sight with the deadly accurate French artillery. Given the massive French superiority in guns, just the sheer scale of bombardment was supposed to decimate the British center. Additionally, the attack on Hougoumont was sure to siphon away the British troops towards the right flank. The battle was supposed to be over way before the arrival of any Prussian reinforcements, which wasn't supposed to happen in any event, as Marshal Grouchy was on the Prussian tail, with a third of Napoleon's army, a third that he really could have used. Even if the Prussians somehow managed to appear, the battle would be almost over, and Grouchy would pop up on their heels, thus maintaining the French advantage. And if all else failed, Napoleon had his secret weapons, his sons, the undefeated Imperial Guards. So with his sons and daughters, Napoleon planned to start the victorious battle first thing in the morning. Notice a disturbing propensity to use his children in battle. Napoleon had really hoped that the Grand Battery, his crown jewel, would soften the enemy position to the point where a direct assault would crush the enemy line. But all his experience as a gunner told him that this time might be different. Why? To answer this question, let us talk cannons, round shots, and mud. First, and most importantly, Recall that Napoleon did have an overwhelming superiority in guns, and he liked to use them offensively, 
as compared to the British, which used them mostly in a defensive mode. His guns were more powerful and heavier 12-pound cannons, while the heaviest British guns were 9-pounders. French guns also shot round shots, shells, and grape shots. A round shot was just that, a round ball with no explosive, which was particularly damaging to a tight enemy formation, such as a column, since the cannonball literally bounced off the ground, each time causing more devastation. Given the knee-deep mud, which was caused by the torrential rain throughout the previous night, the bouncing ability of the round shot would be considerably diminished. Additionally, shells, which were filled with explosives, had a fuse, which could easily be extinguished if swallowed by the muddy mess. Add to that the fact that Wellington would no doubt position most of his troops on the reverse slope, thus making them invisible to the gunners, and it becomes clear why Napoleon was understandably worried that his opening ceremony of bombardment would not have the desired impact. He did have another card that he could play, and, if successful, would all but assure French victory. The idea of siphoning British troops away from the center to reinforce the right flank, where Napoleon would threaten to capture Hougoumont. And so, Napoleon decided to attack the right flank by besieging the chateau. He was sure that once Hougoumont was threatened, Wellington would send the reinforcements, thus weakening his center and paving the way for the main French attack and the road to victory. To accomplish this important mission, Napoleon sent a truly royal commander. His Majesty, Jerome I, by the grace of God, the King of Westphalia and the Prince of France. But he would have been none of these things had he not also been Napoleon's brother. Napoleon had always been big on family loyalty, or nepotism, and all his siblings benefited insanely from his patronage. But to entrust the command of the first real action in this decisive campaign, Napoleon must have had great confidence in his baby brother. A picture is worth a thousand words, as they say. And in the absence of pictures, personal correspondence can paint an equally vivid image. Here is a quick excerpt from the letter that Napoleon wrote to Jerome before the start of the Russian campaign. You have much ambition, some intelligence, a few good qualities, but you are spoiled by stupidity, by great presumption, and have no real knowledge. Oh, so maybe he didn't have a lot of faith in his brother. This letter was written when Napoleon still liked his younger brother. Well, sort of. Four years later, he wrote another letter to Jerome. You are hateful to me. Your conduct disgusts me. I know no one so base, so stupid, so cowardly. You are destitute of virtues, talents, and resources. Wow. Wow. You can really feel the brotherly love. And yet. Family loyalty prevailed over logic, and Napoleon allowed Jerome to lead his largest unit, the 6th Infantry Division. Napoleon's low opinion of his brother's abilities was correct, and Jerome had much to prove to his older brother. And instead of taking his order to besiege Hougoumont in order to draw the British reinforcements away from Wellington Center, Jerome took it as a friendly suggestion. He decided that he would win the day by not only besieging this mini-fortress, but by storming and capturing it. Neither Napoleon, nor His Royal Highness Jerome I, knew at the start of the day of a British Lieutenant Colonel, James MacDonald, the one Wellington entrusted with defense of Hougoumont. Had they known of him, the course of this battle may have been very different. After spending a miserable night plagued by all sorts of health-related malaises, and waiting impatiently for the ground to dry up, Napoleon finally started the great battle with the attack on Hougoumont around 10.30 a.m. And just at this cliffhanger moment, I will end the episode, only to finish this historically outrageous, or outrageously historic, day in my next episode. Please subscribe to my channel, and you'll get a notification when the new episode is available. For those of you who just want to know how it all ends, come closer. Closer? Please, come closer. Too close. A little too close. I can't tell you. Sorry, but you'll have to wait for the next episode. 
Thanks for watching The Most Intriguing Military Battles.